Thank you for joining us this evening as we explore life generations ago where the land of the rising sun starts the day for our world. We'll begin in a moment. At the start of our journey, I'll sound the singing bowl. Please listen silently for the tone to abate. The cherry tree was a gift to Washington, D.C. during the time of Perry's visit and invites us to consider Japan's awakening period into the modern world. This block print, the great wave of Kamaguchi, evokes our imagination to feel the height of isolationism and unique beauty in the way of Nippon. Tanazaki gives us a glimpse into the mindset of the average Japanese person transitioning into the 20th century as he reminds his countrymen that we find beauty not in the thing itself, but in the patterns of shadows, the light and the darkness that one thing against another creates. Were it not for shadows, there would be no beauty. To sharpen our focus on Tanazaki's intent, let's review the events that led to his crisis, or his perceived need to wake his countrymen. Japan heralded Tanazaki's birth by rejecting a 200-year practice of isolation. As a 16-year-old crown prince assumed the throne, he ended the Tokugawa shogunate, effectively altering a safe, secure, and well-trod way of life for 35 million people. This Meiji Restoration began about the same time as the U.S. period of Reconstruction, but lasted even longer. The ancient capital of Edo was moved to the summer residence and renamed Eastern Capital, or Tokyo. After the failure of the Boxer Rebellion by the monks of the Shaolin Order just across the Sea of Japan, Russia endured a surprise defeat which established Nippon as a world power. None of this historical context receives even a word from Tanizaki. Neither do the iconoclastic Japanese cultural practices and ways of thought like wabi-sabi, kintsugi, or bushido. These tremendous influences go unspoken in the text, yet undoubtedly created tremendous shaping forces informing the thoughts penned by our author. This seems predominantly because his audience experienced the same culture time as the writer with these concepts a part of life and not an idea with need of explanation. Let's briefly examine a fun fact about Kintsugi to explore a different way one might view the world. Edward Hirsch, the director of the Metropolitan Museum, says that, quote, there's never been a culture without art, end quote. For most of us, this need to create spills forth with a certain desire for perfection or realism. Certainly, in our quest to create unique worlds in cyberspace or popular cinema, we try to accurately capture what lies in our imagination so we can share our particular vision. What happens then when our most prized, one-of-a-kind creations shatters on the floor? After a bit of emotional pain, we might try to effect a seamless repair to return the piece, car, or even relationship to its original perfection. 
An unnoticeable repair is rare for most things and impossible for porcelain. So it was when a priceless porcelain vase, returned to its owner from the original manufacturer's attempted repair process. The piece was exquisitely ugly with metal staples holding shards together. The technology did not exist to regrow or return porcelain to its original form. Beauty, for both form and function, required a different approach. Instead of hiding the insults, master Japanese craftsmen celebrated them. The imperfections returned to beauty in both form and original function. As we watch our world shatter today under the impact of COVID-19, I wonder what we might make of it tomorrow. Perhaps a Kintsugi mindset might find a new way of beauty. For information about Kintsugi, click the links on the bottom left of the screen. As we turn our attention to the translation by Thomas J. Harper in Edward G. Seiden's sticker of Junichiro Tanazaki's essay, In Praise of Shadows, let's be aware of our own biases and cultural background. Mine are captured here, and I imagine you have both your own unique and shared mindsets. I felt he called attention to culture with not just the backwards glance, but perhaps even more strongly with a noticing of the empty spaces and things gone unnoticed in the bustle of busyness. He focuses our attentions a little more acutely on the intentions of those who have gone before. For me, even more striking than the puppet theater or blackened teeth, is Tanazaki's imagery of the mysterious darkness inhabiting the traditional house, the almost secret alcove slowly revealing a hidden treasure with only the slightest glow of reflected light dancing off of gold leaf. Calligraphy serves to invoke a meditative state and may promote healing. Tanazaki notes that even the paper used lends a late evening quality to the light which illuminates it. The brush, of course, allows significantly more expression than the Western pen. On page 12, Tanizaki begins a story of the magic of a candlelit dinner and his difficulty in finding a place that would turn down the electricity and permit him the pleasure of a dinner enchanted by the light of candles. In eschewing ceramics for traditional wooden bowls, Tanizaki reminds a reader that so many things are deeply intertwined in one experience. The heaviness and insulating character of ceramic disrupts the sacred miso as much as the glare of Edison's invention. How different would be flight if the Japanese had invented the airplane, asked Tanizaki. In a brief departure from darkness, Tanizaki shows us a natural world, freshly washed with comfortable coolness, gentle streams, and pure contentment. Even in the Japanese toilet, time passes without hurry or anxiety. Thank you for listening to this point. If you care to respond, I wonder your thoughts on these two questions. First, how a culture might maintain the best of its past and move forward without being consumed by the globally dominant. And also, what similarities do you see us face globally today with the COVID pandemic as the people of Japan faced in the time when In Praise of Shadows was released?